message this morning is preserving and fostering unity in the church. Preserving and fostering unity. Now, what determines the unity of a church? How do we know if a church is united? What are some signs? Well, of course, we know that a church is united if everyone wore the same kinds of clothing, right? And we know that a church is united if everyone believes the same doctrine down to the minutest detail, correct? We know that a church is united if we all send them to Christian school. We all have the same maturity level. We all have the same socioeconomic status and we all have the same convictions on everything. We're united because we shop at the same supermarket. Is that right? Of course, the answer is no. Christian unity is not any of those things. And while it may be hard to achieve unity, the way of achieving it is simple. Unfortunately, Real, lasting Christian unity is rare. That's why in Psalm 133, the psalmist says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in, together in unity. But what we do know is that unity is something that is established by Christ. You know, when Christ died, he made peace between God and man. We all deserve God's judgment, but when Christ died, he removed that judgment from those who believe. So now we have peace with God. We're no longer enemies of God. But Christ also made peace between natural enemies. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, it tells us we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free. In other words, Christians of different races, backgrounds, social status, those who are slaves and those who are masters, when he died, he brought them together, he united them, and he gave them peace. And this is why Ephesians 4.3 tells us to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know, we can't develop unity. Unity is already there. All we have to do is to maintain it and to foster it. Christ establish it, we need to preserve it. So how do we do that? How do we preserve that unity? Now, we've already discussed it's not by dressing the same. It's not by having the same taste in music. It's not in raising our families the same way. That's not unity. That is actually called uniformity. And we're not called to uniformity in the Bible. We're called to unity. And so this is what we want to consider in today's passage. And it is fitting for us to consider this because we had confession of faith today. You saw tall, short, short hair, long hair, male, female, different ways of dressing. You saw a little baby. They're all different. We can't treat them all the same way. There's no uniformity, but there can be unity. So there are three things to consider. Firstly, we are united under the gospel because of Christ. Secondly, our unity is evident through our fellowship. And thirdly, our unity is protected through radical fellowship. So firstly, we are united under the gospel because of Christ. You know, at Pentecost, 3,000 people came to faith in Jerusalem. These were 3,000 people that were against Jesus initially. And after they came to Christ, the church started to grow more and more. And with that growth, there also came trouble. The authorities, they imprisoned and they interrogated the disciples. But despite persecution, we see in verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. So there was unity, one heart, one soul. There was one accord, they were agreed. And for the church to be described in this way was amazing because this was not a small church. By this time, the church had grown to over 5,000 men. Interpretation is probably 10,000 with women and children. You know, they started with 120 disciples 
and that grew to over 10,000 in a matter of one, maybe two, maybe three months. Now, these were all the pilgrims that had come for the feasts. They were from different countries. They spoke different languages. In Acts 2, it tells us that they came from all over. They came from the east, from Mesopotamia, from Persia. They came from the north, like Cappadocia and Phrygia. They came also from the west, like Egypt and Cyrene, and some even came as far as from Rome. And because they did not speak the same language, yes, they were all Jews, but, you know, it's kind of like the Chinese diaspora, you know, uh, they're spread all over the world, right? You, you know, you've got immigrants, you know, from other countries, you know, when I was in Australia, you had those from Sri Lanka, their kids couldn't even speak Tamil or Sinhalese anymore, you know, uh, and we laugh because my kids can't speak Mandarin, right? So, uh, you know, they did not speak their original tongue anymore. So that is why God gave the apostles the gift of languages so that they could communicate the gospel. So those who believe, they remained, right? They didn't go home. They wanted to be part of this growing church. And they were all of one heart, of one soul. And that's quite amazing because, you know, different places, Jewish races, customs, and language systems, but yet there was unity. And you can never force uniformity. You can never, well, rather, you can force un uniformity, but you can't ever force unity. You know, there are church movements or political movements or, you know, uh, communes in the world where they strongly mold their people into wearing the same kinds of clothes, you know, educate their children only in Christian schools, listen only to Christian music, you know, probably have the same political ideology. But that kind of uniformity will instill a judgmental inflexibility, and that will actually be dangerous to true unity. Why? Because they will think we're the only right ones. They're not dressed the same as we are. They don't listen to the same music as we do. They don't have the same political ideals as we do. So they become right, the only right ones in their eye. You know, even though we may have all believed the same gospel, because you don't dress the same as I do, you don't have the same lingo, you may say things which I may deem a bit offensive, or you don't feel as strongly on a particular issue as I do, or maybe your prayers are too formal, or maybe your prayers are too, you know, informal, then these things will divide us because these things then become far more important than the gospel, all right? And it also creates an inflexibility in us because we don't see that Christ's people are at different levels of sanctification. And, you know, many people cannot tell the difference between creed and code. What's creed and code? Creed is basically what we believe, what we practice according to the word of God. Code is a set of human laws. And sometimes we elevate these codes in order to achieve uniformity, and thereby we invariably de-emphasize creed, which is needed for true unity. But people often conflate the two. But these people in Acts, they were not fixated on music, dressing, schooling systems, or politics, but they were focused on the gospel. And that's why there was this unusual phenomenon, 10,000 united people, right? And it says in verse 32, the reason why they were one heart and one mind is because they, this multitude, they believed. They believed they were sinners, they believed they had need of a savior, and they believed um, that they needed to repent of their sins. And so this faith, this faith in the gospel controlled them. It united them with others who believe in the same gospel. Now, how does an orchestra of different instruments play together in harmony? They're different. You've got the woodwinds. Right? The woodwinds are not the brass. Uh, you've got the percussion, they're not stringed instruments. 
So even stringed instruments are different, aren't they? You have the violin, you have the cello, you have the double bass, and even the seemingly useless viola, they're not the same. But they are in harmony together because they all follow the same music score and they follow the conductor. They follow his lead. So similarly, we have the scripture and we have Christ. We're all different, right? We're all different. There's no uniformity perhaps, but we have the same beliefs and we're growing more and more united in Christ. You know, that's why 1 John 1, 7 is a scary indication of how Christian we are. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Now, if we can't have fellowship one with another, what does it mean? It means that we may not be walking in the light. If there's a split, if there's a falling out, it means that someone has not been walking as a Christian. Because disunity comes when we forget the gospel. But when we live the gospel, you know, we are preferring one another. We remember that Jesus left heaven's glory to come to earth to die for sinners. He died for his enemies because he loved them. And so when we believe the gospel, we humbly mourn for our sins. And when we live it out, we are kind and compassionate and love others whom Christ has forgiven. So there can only be unity under the gospel. The multitude of them that believed were one heart and one soul. So unity can only be achieved through the gospel. But secondly, unity is evident through our fellowship. Verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. So the unity was evident in their sharing of their possessions. What they had, they shared. They fellowship. Now Luke describes this in two ways. He describes it positively as well as negatively. Positively, he said they had all things common. Now, the word common is the Greek word koinos, where we get the word koinonia or fellowship from. So this word common or koinos shows that whatever they had was not sacred to one person. He did not say, this is my phone, but this is for whomever to use. Well, it's my phone, but whoever can use it, right? So these believers, they shared everything, all 10,000 of them. Now, why was this? It's because those who had stayed in Jerusalem were from other countries, and they had wanted to stay there, continue with the Christian movement, and these foreigners didn't have room and lodging. So, other Christians in Jerusalem opened their homes. So, he says it positively, all things, they had all things in common, but he also says it negatively. Neither said any of them, meaning no one said his position, his possessions were only his. And the Greek tense is continuous. They kept on saying, no, 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 this is, yes, it's mine, but no, 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 it's not only mine. Yes, yes, you can have. Yes, go ahead and take it. Yes, my packet food, yes, please go ahead and have it. So what did they share? What did they share? Now, context-wise, yes, they shared money. Now, these visitors were out of town. They brought money with them, but very soon the money would run out and there was no ATM. So they had to rely on the generosity of others. So what did they need? They would have needed food. They would have needed shelter, things that every day we need. Everyday people need these things. So these believers in Jerusalem, they shared everything they had, All right? Now, this is not communism. This is Christianity. And the reason why they did this is because they were controlled by the gospel. Verse 33, it says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. 
So why were they so generous? It's because great grace was upon them all. Unity is a product of great grace. Their unity was not based on code, but based on creed. Their creed, their belief taught them that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Their creed taught them that Christ became poor so that they who are spiritually poor would have eternal spiritual riches. Their creed taught them that Christ shared in their guilt so that he might share with us his holiness. So their generosity was based on creed. Now, it's very easy when we talk about giving, when we talk about service, you know, when we talk about being office bearers and nominations, it's very easy for me to guilt people by using Old Testament law. I can tell you, you know what? If you really want to be faithful, you got to give your tithe. 10%. You know, we can guilt you into giving, but we are not living under the law. Christ has fulfilled the law. Instead, his law is the law of love. Because he loved us, we also ought to love one another. Because Christ gave, we all also ought to give. So when we understand grace, that is when we give. When we understand grace, that's when we forgive. When we understand forbearance, that's when we forbear with one another. When we realize that Christ gave us strength when we were weak, we will be kind to those who are weak. Now, when Zacchaeus was saved, he gave not to obtain forgiveness, but because he was forgiven. Mary Magdalene, when she was saved from those seven devils, she was a rich woman from Magdala, she gave to support Jesus and the 12 disciples. Now, if they had only tithed their 10%, the kingdom would not have grown. The gospel, more than the law, demands all from us because Christ gave all to us. And look, it's not just about money. Yes, the context is about money, but there are so many other things. You know, these people in Jerusalem, it required them to give energy. Imagine the, the stressful situation. 10,000 people in Jerusalem. What are you going to do? I got to take care of these people. Well, what food do I have in my pantry? I have to go to the store and buy food for them. I got to look at my pot, you know, dig it. Where's the money? Where's, where's this going to come from? I'm sure husbands and wives argued about who would clean the house because Bob from Egypt or Joe from Rome don't know how to take off their shoes when they enter the house. Why? Because they're from Egypt and from Rome, right? They don't take off shoes. I'm just giving an example, right? Or maybe it required time. Ahot had to go halfway across Jerusalem just to buy rice because Ahok from Cyrene ate up all the rice yesterday, right? Why? because maybe Ahok yesterday was helping Jenny from Bethany retile her roof. But Ahok doesn't speak Hebrew or Aramaic. He couldn't communicate that he did all of that work. So they served one another. They fed one another. They gave their time for one another. They struggled with perhaps, you know, some of these heart issues to help one another. So unity is preserved through fellowship, through giving. But unity, thirdly, unity is protected through radical fellowship. The radical fellowship is not giving only what is convenient, not only giving what we're able to, not only giving what is expected of us, and again, I'm not speaking about money. You know, we send our kids to fellowship, we come to church, we are involved in this and that, but when it comes to things which are truly inconvenient, then we start to think twice whether we truly want to give of those things. There's a person that I need to speak to about Christ, uh, but he's not going to listen to me. 
ah, you know, he's not going to receive me. Uh, Better not speak. And at times, we only want to fellowship with those who are uniform to us, those who have the same clothes, same race, same music, same lingo, same judgmental spirit, same complaints. Imagine if we were to radically give and fellowship, unity will be preserved. You know, in church, we can say, ye, that person's so unspiritual. I don't want to have to deal with that person. You know, God saved him from his unspirituality. God can save you from your self-righteousness. Or some of us will say, ye, that person's so legalistic. Go ahead, don't do this, don't do that. God saved him from his legalism as much as he saved you, perhaps from your unholiness and libertarianism. No, libertinism, all right? So if we were to forego these things, radically give to one another, share with one another, then unity will not only be preserved, but be protected. You know, in church, there can be a lot of grumbling. In Acts 6, there was something that happened that threatened the unity of the church. People were grumbling. The Hebrew-speaking widows were grumbling that they didn't have enough food compared to the Greek-speaking Uh, or rather the Greek-speaking widows were complaining that the Hebrew-speaking widows were receiving more, and so they started to grumble. And unity is always threatened by complaints. When you complain, when you moan, when you come together in your groups and, and stir up these feelings, we threaten unity. And of course, we may say these widows were justified because they were neglected, but there's no justification there. It's natural, it's understandable, but whatever it was, their grumbling jeopardized unity. And we all grumble. You know, we have so many grievances that those grievances become more important than people. We focus on them like they are precious trophies to polish and display. You know, they become something that we use to distinguish ourselves from other people. You know, I learned a new collective noun yesterday, which I thought, hey, this is very timely. I'll use it in the sermon. You know, a collective noun like a flock of sheep or a school of fish. Do you know what alligators are called? The collective noun for alligators? A congregation of alligators, right? So we are like a congregation of crocs when we grumble. And then what happens is that we bite and we devour one another in our unhappiness. But here in Acts 4, no one was neglected. Therefore, no one grumbled. Verses 34 and 35, it reads, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So neither was there any of them that lacked. 10,000 people, no one lacked. Now I'm sure people were poor. You know, we're not called to remove poverty. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. Uh, But there was no one who was needy. Everyone who had a need was filled, and so no one therefore grumbled. The reason why no one was needy is because those who were possessors of lands or houses sold them. So there were in Jerusalem those who were very rich Christians. Now, so that you know this is not a message on money, there are those who are very rich in spiritual gifts. There are those who are very rich in time. There are those who are very rich in ability, right? So here in its context, we see that there were rich Christians. They sold and they brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So they developed or they established a benevolent fund. They didn't take it upon themselves to give as they saw fit, but they brought it to the apostles. Now, these people didn't say, well, 
if I give, huh, they will get used to it. How? Right? And if they get used to it, maybe they will keep on asking. But no, you see, as much as the gospel works in the rich, the gospel should also work in the poor, right? In those who are needy. Those who give would give excessively. Those who receive would give in kind, would give and, and would, would experience that gratitude. And so the gospel works. And hence, this preserved unity, it protected unity, it stopped any grumbling from starting. And so their giving was also in proportion to how God had blessed them. See, some had sold their houses and their lands. What is the purpose of your riches? What is the purpose of your spiritual gifts? What is the purpose of the time that the Lord has given to you? What will you do radically? And we see in verses 36 to 37 an example of radical fellowship. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here you have this guy called Joseph. He was nicknamed Barnabas. He was a rich man. He sold his land. He brought the money to the central fund. And I guess he did that because he knew where the apostles could use it. Or he knew that the apostles knew where they could use it. And this was his way of remaining anonymous. But I suppose people knew it was him. Or he had been doing this radically to other people. And so he was nicknamed Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And such was Barnabas that not only did he radically give in terms of money, he radically gave in terms of encouragement. You remember when Paul first became a Christian, no one would associate with him. Only Barnabas befriended Paul, and he brought Paul along to introduce him to others. When Mark, you know, the first time he left the mission field, then he wanted to come back, Paul was against taking Mark back. But Barnabas knew that this man had to be encouraged. And so his ministry of encouragement became his nickname. And here he encouraged radically. And this is how many people in the church preserve unity, where they stop grumbling and they start encouraging. Those who have, they give excessively. Those who are, have the gift of prayer, they pray incessantly. Those who are able to teach, they teach radically. Those who have time, they can spend time radically. Those who have homes and food can show hospitality radically. Those who have the gift of cleaning up, they can clean up radically. You see, this is the gospel. This is the way to unity. It is not to force people into a uniform way of thinking, a uniform way of dressing but it is to preach the gospel. So when Christians use what they have been given, the result is growth and love. So like I said, yes, the context of this passage is money, but there's so many other things that we can and need to share. Like I have said, our time, our spiritual gifts, our friendship, our abilities, our effort, our homes, our patience. All of these things are necessary for preservation of unity. And I think it's important to add this. Sometimes in a busy church, those who serve busily may be tempted to grumble. They have the burden of service. And they need you to serve too. Because in the church, there are those who are crying out for encouragement, instruction, care, friendship. Their needs can only be met by you. Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so as we come to the close of this passage and this message here, the application is 
Simple. What will you give for Christ's kingdom? You know, Christ gave his life for the church. And by giving his life for the church, it fostered unity between natural enemies. What will you give to foster unity and growth? So Christ gave his life. His disciples were always complaining and grumbling and fighting and quarreling with one another. But because of his death, they became of one accord. The Jews, they were always warring with the Samaritans. But as Christians now, they were one with one another. Jesus came and he died where once his own family members mocked him. Now they were serving him. Those who were shouting for his crucifixion, all 3,000 of them came to faith. And the reason why is because he gave of himself. He loved his enemies. So when we give of ourselves to our family here, when we do so lavishly, we will love one another more. As the scriptures say, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so too now, those of you who have joined the church, serve the Lord, fellowship, make friends of God's people, share your substance, your time, your gifts for the unity of the church. And this brings us to a sobering end. It makes us wonder, for those who never share their substance, who never share their gifts, who never serve others or give their time, because if unity comes from radical fellowship and fellowship is birthed from the grace of God, if we're not giving these things and serving one another, where are we at when it comes to the gospel? Because the grace of God produces this kind of service and love in us for others. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and how it teaches us to preserve, to protect that unity. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we look at the early church and all of their lavish fellowship, their sharing, their giving of themselves, help us to be confronted with the same duty that we all ought to do the same to one another. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to grow us in the peace and the unity of Christ in this congregation. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.